Happy Saturday, folks. I'm just going to jump right in and discuss a topic that I'm currently working on, which I find fascinating. As many people know, I am a huge proponent of passive and novel Lanham Act theories. This one is going to be long, and it's going to be mostly for the attorneys and the academics out there. So to back up a step, we'll just orient ourselves in like the Lanham Act 101 wheelhouse. The Lanham Act is a federal trademark act. But a lot of people don't realize that the Lanham Act is broader than just trademark protection and trademark cases, trademark litigation, etc. The Lanham Act also contains incredibly aggressive rules, regulations, etc. regarding false advertising. I'll go back to an example that I've used time and time again because it's like a paradigmatic false advertising example. You have a company called Joe's grass-fed beef, and he sells his beef as being organic, it's humanely raised, certified grass-fed, etc. It's all a lie. Joe's not got certified beef, it's not organic, it's certainly not grass-fed. He is selling you regular old antibiotic filled up, hormoned up meat that he's getting from some corn feed lot in Nebraska. That is textbook false advertising. Any of Joe's competitors would have standing to file a Lanham Act lawsuit and prevent Joe from continuing to false advertise, they would also be able to seek damages. Now, proving those damages is very difficult. It depends on how many players are in the market, what the market looks like, what the exact nature of the representations was. I won't get into proving damages. That's a whole nother discussion on Lanham Act damages. The point being that the Lanham Act goes far beyond just trademark protection and trademark infringement. False advertising is one of those areas of the Lanham Act that relatively few lawyers know about. Even these lawyers who hold themselves out as being you know, commercial litigation, complex commercial litigation, etc., etc., I've come across a number of these attorneys who had no idea whatsoever that you could pursue a false advertising claim under the Lanham Act. I've actually seen some of these lawyers from big corporate firms file a motion to dismiss a Lanham Act false advertising claim, and their argument is that there's not a trademark involved, so the case has to be dismissed because the Lanham Act only deals with trademark. I've literally seen that in federal court, um, so it does happen. The bottom line there is that this is a very poorly understood area of law. Not only is it a poorly understood area of law, it's also like the undiscovered country. Okay, there's all sorts of uncharted territory in terms of how you can use Lanham Act false advertising cases. Now, if you go back to um, Lexmark, the recent Supreme Court decision, Lexmark basically says that anybody who's you know impacted by your false advertising has standing to bring a, a claim. They don't need to necessarily be a direct competitor. If they're somewhere in the market and they're being impacted by it, whether they're upstream, downstream, what have you, they can bring a false advertising claim. Now, consumers can't. That is a, 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 an actual legitimate limitation to Lanham Act standing. Consumers cannot pursue Lanham Act false advertising cases. but. Other players in the market, competitors, vendors, suppliers, etc., anybody who's sort of in this zone of interest who's affected by it, they can pursue a Lanham Act claim for false advertising. So that's one. You're seeing some broadening out of, of Lanham Act standing. The standing requirements for Lanham Act false advertising cases have been relaxed in the post-Lexmark era. What I think you're going to see, um, sort of dovetailing with, with Lexmark and the broadening out of of Lanham Act standing, I think you're also going to see a broadening out of the other big ticket item in Lanham Act cases, which is advertising. Okay, let me explain this. Courts are always looking to police the plaintiff side of law and to shut down um, efforts to use a particular statute to pursue claims under a particular statute um, if those claims don't belong there. And, and to a certain extent, yeah, that, that's, that's fair, right? You shouldn't be able to bring a claim if it doesn't fit under, you know, 
what, what that law is or what that statute says. But in my opinion, a number of courts have gotten too aggressive um, in policing novel uses of the Lanham Act. And they've also gotten too aggressive from a standpoint that they're policing claims that are, are proper under the plain language of the statute. And what's that, in my opinion? That's judicial activism, right? I see judicial activism everywhere throughout the country, routinely, on a daily basis, where, you know, in, in, in any given court, any given day throughout America, I can guarantee you there's a case where the judge just doesn't like the case, and, you know, the judge is going to read the statute or read something into the statute that's not there to just get rid of the case or rule the way that he or she wants to. It happens all the time. And you see this in Lanham Act cases. And in fact, um, in Lexmark, you know, Scalia basically said as much. He basically says, hey, look, read the statute. The statute says what it says, and you have to apply the plain language of the statute. So how does that translate to, to advertising? Okay. Well, historically, Courts have wanted to view advertising as pure mass market advertising, right? Because one of the requirements for pursuing a Lanham Act false advertising claim is, of course, there has to be advertising. And so courts have historically taken a sort of more restrictive view of what constitutes advertising. They really want it to be TV commercials, radios, internet click ads, banner ads, pop-ups, you know, things of that nature. They want it to be traditional advertising. The problem with that is that it's 2019. And in today's world and today's market, the, the line between content, advertising, branding, marketing, it's, it's all over the map, right? Um, just because it's on their website, um, does that make it advertising? What if it's uh, you know, sp sponsored um, posts that show up on people's Facebook or LinkedIn? Um, what if it's an email blast that they send to customer lists, right? Say the, say the company buys customer lists and customer lists has millions and millions of customer email addresses and they send out these news blasts and, and they contain false statements. Is that advertising? So, you know, courts have sort of pushed back against an expansion of what constitutes advertising. And I think that that's improper. Um, and I've actually won a number of decisions where I have said something was advertising for Lanham Act purposes. The other side has said, no, it's not traditional advertising. And the court has agreed with me. Um, most recently, the most recent case where that happened involved a um, some kind of construction worker engineer person who left one company. He did not have a non-compete or a non-solicitation, nothing of the sort. He started his own new company in the same industry and his former boss in the company that he used to work for um, started this concerted smear campaign to go to everybody in the industry and say, Hey, Michael stole all of our stuff. He's a con artist. He's a fraud. He stole our trade secrets. He's being investigated for criminal misconduct. You know, he's going to go to jail. If you do business with him, you could get dragged into litigation and an investigation and everything else. And we said, you know, that's false advertising. We said, that's, that's false advertising. This, this company is going out there. They are attacking a rival. They are spreading all of these falsehoods about him and his business and his ethics and, and criminal misconduct, etc. And they're circulating it to, you know, dozens, if not a hundred or more customers and vendors within the relevant industry. And the other side, of course, says, well, that's not advertising. It, it can't be. It's just, you know, he sent some emails. Well, the court, on a motion to dismiss, agreed with us that, you know, plausibly could constitute advertising. And that's an important point, right? You have a lot of these Lanham Act cases where, where in my opinion, respectfully, courts, um, courts conflate summary judgment and, and a motion to dismiss stage, right? There's, there's no reason under Rule 8 of the Federal Rules and Twombly why... You should not be able to allege, hey, this stuff was circulated widely enough in the relevant market that it constitutes advertising. And that's all you have to state 
to state a plausible Lanham Act claim. So if a court dismisses that and says, no, this can't be advertising, I, I think that violates Rule 8. I think that violates Twombly. And I think that's the kind of case that's ripe for an appeal because we need, um, out of the appellate courts, we need more decisions um, broadening out what constitutes um, false advertising, what constitutes advertising in the Lanham Act context. And we need these things to clarify that, hey, look at the motion to dismiss stage. It's Rule 8 and Twombly. And, and, and subjecting the, the claim to anything more burdensome than that um, is a misapplication of, of well-established law. So where does this bring us to, right? We've got the sort of predicate for here's the Lanham Act, here's false advertising, here's advertising and what that can constitute. Well, here's where I'm, I'm trying to take this. Here's the sort of next territory, the uncharted waters that I'd like to get into. There are a couple cases where folks have run the earnings call Lanham Act false advertising claim. And so, you know, a good, good example is basically, not even a good the example, right, is you have a publicly traded company, okay? And, you know, on their earnings call, they make a whole bunch of false statements that they know are false about, you know, their product and their projections, you know, where things are going, right? So say the company makes some kind of, say they're a pharmaceutical company, right? And they make, uh, you know, a, a, a diabetes drug, okay? And they get on their earnings call and they say, you know, this drug is a, a diabetes miracle drug. It can do the following, ABC. It can reduce, you know, blood sugar by XYZ. And, and they give, you know, specific sort of um, examples and, and, and benchmarks and promises of what this drug can do. Well, let's say it turns out that, that all of that is a lie. This was not clinically backed up. It was not properly tested. They cooked the books. They faked the science. They bribe some people for some peer review articles, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody who's, who's been around long enough and studied up enough knows that these sorts of things happen routinely. Like corruption is sort of widespread in American society. We just pretend that it's not. You know, we look around and say, hey, we're better than Cuba and Venezuela. So, you know, just, you know let, us, let us slide. But let's not pretend like sort of peer review fraud doesn't happen and fraud doesn't happen all the time in, in big pharma. So, you got, you know, a company that's out there making these false statements in their earnings calls. And, you know, some courts have said, hey, look, um, it's an earnings call, right? The people on the earnings call are shareholders. A copy of the call transcript is distributed to shareholders. And that can't possibly constitute advertising for the purposes of a, of a Lanham Act false advertising claim. So we got to unpack this, all right? Advertising to who, right? You back up, you say, okay, advertising to the shareholders, right? False advertising to the shareholders. That, that doesn't necessarily get you there because the, the shareholders are the ones who would be harmed by this, right? It's more of a securities fraud case that you'd be repackaging as a Lanham Act false advertising case. So, so the, the, the shareholders being misled, that's not really going to get you into the proper arena. But what is, right? Well, earnings calls, earnings call transcripts, right? Even though they might just be distributed to the shareholders, right? They're the ones who get it in the mail. They get their copy of the earnings call transcript. But these things are broadly disseminated. They are read by all sorts of um, actors who are sort of related to the situation, right? Like they're read by vendors and, and, and third parties and counterparties and people who are looking to do joint ventures and make deals with this company and et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can make the argument that the the dissemination of these things, you put them up on Seeking Alpha, they're available sometimes on, on you know, online on various websites. So you can make the argument that these things are more broadly disseminated than just going to the shareholders. And if you can, can come up with a, a specific theory under which you or, or your client or you know, the, 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 potential, um, the potential plaintiff here is 
in the arena, right? They're somewhere in the market and they are somehow being adversely affected by false statements made on the earnings call. Well, um, what are some, some good sort of direct examples of that? Well, there would, would have to be statements on the earnings call um, where it's not just securities fraud, it's not just affecting the shareholders. There would have to be statements on the earnings call about you know, the company's capabilities, company's product, you know, proof of the company's um, you know, capabilities, ability, in the pharmaceutical example, you know, proof of what the drug can do, you'd have to be able to prove that it sort of directly harmed you in the same market. I can envision situations where that's possible, especially if the, the major players in the market, if it's like a two-player market, right, where them, you know, saying, hey, our new diabetes drug does all these things, right, and, and, and it starts to take market share away from your diabetes drug based on those false representations contained in the earnings calls. I could see in that context um, a Lanham Act false advertising case predicated on earnings calls. Now, there are some bad cases out there. Um, there's some bad cases out there, I believe out of California. There's definitely some out of Kansas, all both federal courts, obviously, because we're dealing with Lanham Act claim. Um, but I don't think those handful of decisions um, shooting down Lanham Act earnings call false advertising cases, I don't think those handful of decisions are really just positive. None of them are binding, right? None of them are coming out of the, the, the appellate court. So there's nothing out there that's binding on this. Um, and on balance with the right set of facts and drafted in the proper way, I think you can put together a Lanham Act false advertising case based on false statements and earnings calls by a competitor who was affected by those false statements, and you can do it in such a fashion that it should be a motion to dismiss. That's just food for thought, um, you know, so all you lawyers out there and academics, professors, dig into it. Um, if you want to poke it apart, you know, if, if, you, if you think there's something there, um, dispositive as an absolute bar to this, and you want to sort of bounce it around, you know, feel free, shoot me a message, send me an email, whatever, happy to talk it out. All right, folks, thanks for watching. Have a good weekend.